Okay. Uh, my name is Tom Purcell. I'm a consultant with Chariot Solutions. Uh, speaker for this talk is Joe Duffy. He's a uh, founder of Pulumi. Did I get that right, Jeff? All Perfect. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, his talk today is titled Cloud Engineering Developers and Infrastructure Teams Together at Last. Of course, the cloud solves all of our old infrastructure problems. Joe's going to help us to deal with all of our new infrastructure problems. <laughs> All right, Joe, it's all yours. All right, thanks. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm not sure I will solve all of the problems, but I will. I will hopefully help us uh, along the way in our journey uh, to to figure that out. Um, so yeah, so as Tom mentioned, my name is Joe Duffy. I'm uh, founder and CEO of Pulumi. Uh, Pulumi is actually an open source infrastructure as code platform that um, recently we we've, we've released a new version that really helps teams put cloud engineering into practice. So I'm a little biased in this conversation, but I'm, I'm really here to talk about what we're seeing the community uh, uh, do in, the, in this area. And I think cloud engineering really is about, hey, developers and infrastructure teams coming together to build better software together. So really excited to be here today. Looking forward to the talk and, and some, some good Q&A afterwards. To, to sort of give you a sketch of the talk today, uh, broken into really three parts. One, you know, how do we get here? You know, this, this cloud thing is not new. Um, in fact, you know, IT operations is not new. We've been building software for a long time. So it's kind of interesting to look backwards a little bit before we look forwards. Um, the second is, so what is cloud engineering? Um, this is a relatively new concept. How does it relate to DevOps? You know, if I'm a developer, why should I care about cloud engineering? We cover a bit of ground there. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about best practices for how to, how to put cloud engineering into practice. Um, and th this is meant to be more of a sort of, you know, concepts, conceptual overview. I think a lot of these practices can, can apply to different domains, depending on kind of whether you're doing infrastructure for your day job, doing, you know, building applications for your day job. I think for, for anybody working on any aspect of delivering cloud software, there's going to be something in here that hopefully you'll take away and find interesting. So with that, why don't we get started? Um, first. How did we get here? It's been a long kind of winding road over many, many years. And, you know, I, th I think I look back and I think, um, you know, in the 2000s, we started really doing virtualization. The, the interesting thing about, you know, VMware and virtualization to me is suddenly infrastructure went from being, you know, uh, hardware you had to rack and stack in a data center to being something that was managed by software. And that's really, you'll see as we, go throughout this talk, that's, that's sort of a recurring theme where infrastructure really has become software. Um, and because it's software, it, we can apply a lot of the things we know and love about software to infrastructure now. Um, it's programmable, we can automate it. And so if you look back over time, every technology that's really surfaced uh, over the last 20 years, I can't believe it's been 20 years, but um, has really leveraged that key fundamental truth about infrastructure. Um, and so you see things like, you know, hey, AWS, right? And I think it was 2006, if I'm remembering right, when they launched EC2 and S3, um, really saw, you know, open source come into its, 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 uh, its prime with things like, you know, GitHub and you now GitLab and others. Um, of course, Azure and Google Cloud kind of, you know, built on that momentum to move to the public cloud. Um, Docker, of course, now introduced a way for developers to, build and package apps in a, that, that are gonna run in the cloud, very similar to how it might run on your desktop and really is a very fundamentally transformative technology. Kubernetes taking that step forward, you know, uh, what if it wasn't just one container, it was a collection of containers really moving more in the direction of distributed systems rather than the sort of old monolithic model of thinking about simple three tier applications, for example. Um, along the way, we came up with a lot of solutions for how to manage the infrastructure. You know, Puppet and Chef really were born in a world of virtual machines and configuring virtual machines. We see Ansible, Terraform, you know, a, a bit more modern. Pulumi, you know, the, the technology I work on, uh, really leaning into more of the cloud native architectures. But add all this together and we kind of reached a tipping point, you know, not necessarily this year, but it's, it's been a gradual, you know, uh, tipping point, I would say. So what is the tipping point? Well, I, you know, I think, and why is it interesting for developers? I mean, frankly, my, my background is as a developer. I was at, at Microsoft working on .NET, C Sharp, and, and programming languages for, for much of my life. 
Um, and so why am I excited about infrastructure? Well, you look at sort of the client server architectures of the past, right? Um, you know, we started with desktop apps, then we kind of did client server and we had web, web, web apps uh, when the internet, you know, uh, came along and we sort of started very simple. Things were monolithic, they're static, they're pretty slow moving. Today's world is super complicated. Um, the architectures are distributed, they're dynamic, things are changing, applications scale on demand to meet the, the requirements of the workloads rather than having a fixed, you know, hey, I want three servers in a database. Instead, we're seeing a lot of serverless architectures, container-based architectures that can scale dynamically. And you really think about the world very differently when this is the kind of system you're building. And that really was enabled by, you know, hey, Amazon Web Services launching with an API. And suddenly I can hit a REST API and a server appears. That's just completely magical. The things you can do with that are, are, are fundamentally different than what we could do in the past. And I, you know, given my background, I worked a lot on programming languages, um, you know, uh, over the years. And, I kind of look back for inspiration and it turns out we we've, we've been building distributed systems for a very long time. So in terms of, you know, we're still in the backwards looking part of the talk, you know, looking back to learn from history to figure out where we're going from here. You know, I think one thing in hit in the history was we started with distributed systems. You look at a lot of the research that was happening in computers back in the 60s uh, and 70s, it really was a lot of around hey we're programming hardware. Hardware is fundamentally concurrent. How do we how do we manage that? Um, in the 80s and 90s, there were all these programming languages that that were born. Erlang, for example, uh, which still to this day is is obviously you know something you can go use. In fact, WhatsApp is built on Erlang, kind of famously. But all these languages kind of envisioned a world where we're doing distributed programming. Um, and 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 the thing is, we didn't have the we didn't have the cloud back then, right? So there were things like, you know, MPI and scientific computing and supercomputers and all these things where these, these ideas did actually have an impact, but the impact certainly wasn't as broad as it could have been because we didn't have the cloud. And then in the 2000s, this is where I spent my 2000s was working on multi-core. You know, there was this uh, famous phrase, you know, Andy giveth and Bill taketh away. This was, you know, the old Wintel era where, you know, Intel would ship faster processors, you know, Andy Grove at Intel, and then Bill Gates at Microsoft would figure out ways to consume all that, that compute power before the processors even hit the market, right? And so there was this sort of virtuous cycle where software just kept getting faster because of the fact that the, the chips got faster. Um, and then, of course, you know, we sort of hit a wall. We hit a power wall in the 2000s, somewhere around 2004 uh, timeframe. And that meant that multi-core suddenly was really important. Um, and I'm talking about these things because actually all of these things had to happen before we're ready to take the next phase, which, you know, is really cloud engineering at a large scale. And so, you know, in the, in the 2000s, what did we do? Well, we, we had to do multi-core. So everything became much more asynchronous. Um, we had to come up with things like tasks, you know, the await keyword and all these languages showed up. You know, I actually worked on that in kind of C-sharp back then. Now that's pretty commonplace in, you know, JavaScript, Rust, pretty much every, every uh, language out there now has a way of dealing with asynchronous programming. Um, in fact, many runtimes like Node.js itself is just fundamentally asynchronous at its core. You can't even block. I mean, you can. Uh, there are a few APIs that do block, but in general, you know, really encourages a non-blocking style of programming. And if every the reason why this is critical is if you imagine everything is distributed, then everything is also asynchronous. Um, you know, uh, talking to some service is is potentially you know, a network call, but it, you know, may be close, it may be far, it may be over the internet, right? And so this really starts to deeply permeate um, our entire application architectures. And so really, I think this is sort of back to the future, right? It's back to where we began this, this computer science sort of, you know, software journey back in, you know, the 50s and 60s and 70s. And so for that, it's, it's really exciting. Um, 
And so if you, if you kind of reimagine the world as it exists today, you know, if you were to do everything over again, um, you know, all software is cloud software. For today, it, it is not true of all software that exists in the world because there's a lot of legacy software, a lot of stuff we built over the you know, past few decades. But going from now forwards, it's clear we're not building simple desktop apps anymore. In fact, if anything, you know, with edge computing and you know, the, the software is becoming even more distributed, um, but certainly the cloud is really kind of changing everything about um, how we think about that. And what that means is all developers are cloud developers. And I think this is important because it's not, you know, uh, infrastructure isn't, you know, something you can ignore anymore. The cloud isn't something you can ignore. Um, certainly you can try to ignore it, but the, the developers and the teams that are going to have the biggest impact and do more with that cloud software are the ones who really understand the environment and run, understand the capabilities and take advantage of the, the capabilities. And what that means is infrastructure enables that to happen. Infrastructure is actually central to this entire story that we're talking about. Um, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, it was, you know, pretty, it was easy 15 years ago when it was a virtual machine, you know, hey, every quarter I go to my capacity planning team and I tell them, hey, you know what, you know, Bob, I need another a virtual machine, you know, I need one virtual machine and it's okay if it takes three months for you to get back to me and oh, you know, Mary, DBA, I need like, you know, a new SQL server instance and the, the pace was just so much slower. Uh, and in infrastructure really was this, it was almost like, you know, going to do, going to see the accountant, uh, right? Like you, you kind of didn't want to do it. You had to do it. You had to fill out all this paperwork and then you had to wait, you know, to, to see any benefit from it. Um, and the world is, you know, just moved far beyond that. Um, and so when I, I think about this, I think of, you know, cloud builders, we're all building software. We're just working on different parts of the software stack. Much like you know, developers, there's full stack engineers and there's platform engineers and there's systems engineers. Um, some folks might just want, you know, might just stick to CSS and HTML. Uh, some might do backend and work on JavaScript. Some might be writing, you know, microservices and Go. There's a broad array and diversity of expertise, even within the phrase developers. And you know, I think what we're seeing is building for the cloud now in, entails infrastructure expertise. And at the same time, infrastructure experts are applying more software to how they're managing um, the complexity of a fast changing environment um, where you're, you're having to deliver to many, many regions, many applications, many services, it, it's very complex. And, and the complexity there are things that software has been developed to, to, to simplify. And so when I think of what is a cloud builder, well, it's infrastructure experts, it's developers and security engineers. You know, security really is important to, to bring into the fold in the core sort of inner loop of how we're building. Um, and each of these have different titles, right? You know, site reliability engineers, there's people who are practicing DevOps. Um, and I think as we go forward, we're gonna see, you know, more of a unification here and, and more collaboration amongst these folks. And this is not a new idea. Right, I, I can't claim that. Hey, you know, <laughs> there's a light bulb went off and we came up with cloud engineering. No, this is builds on, you know, stands on the shoulders of giants. Right, this is, um, you know, 11, 12 years ago, something like that. You know, we came up with this DevOps uh, concept, and and really, it's helped us on this journey quite significantly. Um, I, I would say it's it's probably safe to say DevOps brought more Dev to Ops than it did Ops to Dev. Um, it, but it gave us a common approach, a, co a common terminology, a common uh, culture where the cloud increasingly became part of how we built and shipped software. Um, and without DevOps, you know, cloud engineering could not take place. So that's my sort of summary of, you know, how do we get here over the last 20 years? Um, hopefully it wasn't too academic, but I do think it's important to, to really just draw inspiration from the past before we figure out, okay, how are we moving into the future? And so now we'll spend a few minutes just talking about what is cloud engineering and why is it interesting? I think a lot of what we talked about hopefully tees up why it's interesting, but we'll go through it in a, a, a bit more detail. To me, cloud engineering is a new way of building. And again, that cloud builders 
uh, conversation we just had. When I say build, I mean we're building from many different angles, the infrastructure, the applications, the, the systems, the security, the policy, all aspects of what it means to build a cloud uh, piece of software. Uh, that's sort of what cloud engineering is about. I think the cloud sort of broke a lot of things about our workflow, you know, broke the inner loop, right? I mean, it's hard to test your code locally and know that when you deploy it, it's going to actually work. Um, it broke this notion that everything I need to run my application exists on my desktop. That actually isn't always the case in a complicated cloud architecture. You know, if I'm working on a microservice and it interacts with 10 other microservices, can I actually run those 10 you know, microservices on my desktop, or do I have to come up with new ways of testing that? You know, I, I'm guessing it's quite difficult. I don't know, uh, but it's probably difficult to run the entirety of, you know, Airbnb's cloud infrastructure on a single desktop. Um, so this requires us to think about new approaches and, and really cloud engineering is, is an answer to how we, how we tackle this, this challenge. And so the definition, as I think of it, is um, cloud engineering is really the idea of using standard software engineering practices to both harness, but also tame the complexity of the modern cloud. I think the level of complexity now requires that we move beyond manual processes and you know simple scripts and domain-specific languages to really embrace the entirety of everything we know and love about software engineering. And, you know, we're not the only ones, you know, I'm not the only one kind of calling it this, you know, um, this is a nice quote from Adrian Cockroft at Amazon, where he says, the benefit to cloud engineering is competitive time to market for ideas, applications, and features. If you can roll something out in a week and your competitor takes three months, you'll just keep running away with things. And we certainly see that. In fact, many folks that, that we've seen in the community practicing cloud engineering ship daily, ship continuously, ship features much, much faster. Um, you know, many people have to wait, you know, a month to get a new piece of infrastructure that's required for them to, for a developer to ship a feature. Whereas with cloud engineering, if you can just empower developers to just, you know, grab hold of that infrastructure when they need it and ship as they are uh, ready to do so, you really move a whole lot faster. And by the way, it's a lot more fun too, <laughs> a lot less red tape. Um, and you know we've actually seen other other companies too. You know, um, Snowflake we've worked with, for example. You know, they call it cloud engineering internally. You know, they they have a cloud engineering organization, Atlassian, the team that actually builds Bitbucket and Jira, and a lot of their um, cloud applications actually call themselves the cloud engineering team. And they've got developers and infrastructure experts. You know, really living alongside each other. They don't have this sort of hard divide between the two. And that's a key element of, of cloud engineering. And so one, one thing that, that is really important is that you know, this plays to people's strengths. It's, it's leveraging what people are good at. It's not trying to square a round peg into a square hole kind of thing. Um, you know, developers are not overnight going to become experts in networking and identity and how to set up Kubernetes clusters and you know, how to do proper encryption and load balancing. And, those are really things that infrastructure experts are going to continue to manage. Um, so when I say cloud engineering, what you shouldn't hear is like that it's, you know, everybody does everything. Clearly there's still specialization in the roles and responsibilities. The key is it becomes a policy decision within the team based on skill sets, based on the business, rather than one implied by arbitrary technology decisions like oh, you know, those folks over there picked this weird DSL and YAML thing. Developers don't want to touch that because of course they want to use Python and, and Go and these great languages. They don't want to have to wade, wade in, you know, reams and reams of, of YAML, which is quite reasonable. Instead, we get everybody on the same level playing field and we decide, okay, who's good at what? And those are the people that pick up these, these bits of, uh, of work. So what, what, what does that look like? Well you know, developers really are more focused on the applications and the services um, where it's about building and packaging those things. It's, it's about adopting modern architectures and bringing those closer to applications like serverless and container architectures. It's about thinking about, hey, if I'm, if I'm building a distributed application, 
the way I debug that thing, the way I understand performance, the way I, you know, uh, maintain my software is just fundamentally different, right? It's much more complicated too, unfortunately. Um, I'm sure f folks here have, uh, you know, this is one of those cases where I'd ask people to raise their hands if I was in person, but like how many people here have spent hours, you know, banging their head against the wall, debugging some asynchronous, you know, bug with promises where, you know, something randomly went wrong and you're trying to reconstruct what happened. And now you're having to like put printfs everywhere and do distributed tracing basically. Um, well now, now just do that across many machines and many services. I mean, it's not, it's not easy. So we, we really think about things differently again, when we're building distributed applications, than than just lifting and shifting monolithic apps into the cloud. And developers think more about like the infrastructure associated with containers and functions. Um, I think the, the line between infrastructure and application code becomes blurry. You know, if let's say I want to do an AWS Lambda, um, is that infrastructure or is that just part of my application? Do, do I want a separate way of provisioning and managing the infrastructure for that? Or is that really, should it just be part of the way I'm shipping my app code? Um, the same thing for, you know, let's say I want a pub sub topic for my application. Is that, is that just a, you know, do I just use that in my application or is it a separate thing that I have to think about with its own lifetime that's orthogonal to the rest of my app code? What we see with people practicing cloud engineering is they actually want to bring those closer to the infrastructure, not keep them further away. Um, but that requires the infrastructure team to, to enable that. And I'll talk in a, in a few minutes. It's, it's not always the case that you have a separate infrastructure team, in fact, depending on the size of your company. You know, if you're, if you're a large enterprise, you probably have infrastructure team over here, app dev over here, and there's a very well-defined interface between those two. Um, if you're a startup, you know, you, you just went to Y Combinator, you're, you're five folks and you're just trying to build like a cloud native application, you're probably not going to divide your team into two. You, you might have an SRE who, who is really that expert in identity and networking and clustering, or you might not, you might actually just say, Hey, that's, that's something developers uh, are going to take care of. But in any case, the folks who are the infrastructure experts on the team really think about how to provision and manage infrastructure how to ensure that best practices are adopted, um, especially you know developers that are self-service provisioning infrastructure may not always know what the best practices are. And these things are subtle and when they're done wrong can lead to cost and security problems. Um, infrastructure teams often are the ones to build and publish the patterns and practices that the team uh, is going to adopt. And then you think about what is shared responsibility well, it's how do I manage all these environments? How, how do the environments depend on each other? You know, uh, we see many teams practicing cloud engineering. They go from, you know, one environment, one production environment to hundreds where they've got, they've got to scale regionally. They've got lots of different services that may be managed independently that, that have dependencies between them. So managing at that scale becomes quite complicated. Um, and then also how do you deliver updates to those uh, as well. So we see infrastructure's code, policies code, CICD are all key elements uh, for how teams work together. And this shared platform, by the way, many teams build their own. Many enterprises are building, actively building their own here. They're, they're often using things like Pulumi or Spinnaker or Kubernetes as a key element of that shared platform. But I present it here as an abstract concept because there are a lot of different ways to to accomplish this. And we see quite, quite a bit of uh, diversity in the way people approach this. And kind of as I was mentioning, you know, developers can be infrastructure experts. And if they're not already, they can become infrastructure experts, right? We often find SMEs emerging within teams that are practicing cloud engineering. Um, you know, maybe one developer on the team just really gets excited about, you know, AWS Aurora and how to scale data warehouses and how to build serverless data warehouses. And that's it's actually a really exciting software engineering problem, you know, how, how to do that. Um, at the same time, infrastructure experts can be developers as well and can increasingly become developers as they think more about automation. Um, we see actually, you know, uh, cloud engineering teams that are actually building entire platforms internally that are a lot like Kubernetes or you know, have self-service capabilities, that's software, but it's the infrastructure team building that. So again, this line just really becomes blurry, uh, which is a good thing. 
And it's a good thing because you know cloud engineering teams are empowered to move faster. They collaborate together in, in new ways. They collaborate on code and software. It's not ticketing. It's not you know meeting after meeting to talk through these things. We can actually just collaborate in pull requests and design documents, all the same things that we know and love about software engineering. And of course, you know, app developers are going to focus more on application code and infrastructure teams are going to focus more on the infrastructure side of things. But really this notion that we're collaborating and working closely together is a key defining characteristic of cloud engineering. This notion of sort of one plus one equals three, if you will. And so that's sort of the definition of cloud engineering. Um, and now we'll spend a minute just talking about, hey, how, you know, if you buy that, that's a good thing. Um, what are some of the things that we're seeing folks in terms of putting cloud engineering into practice? And there are definitely some key best practices that, that, that we see. But the first thing that is really critical, which has nothing to do with technology, um, which on one hand is, is good because the switching cost is in theory very low. Once you decide to do it, you can just go do it. The bad news is changing the way people work together is often one of the hardest things you can do. And I think that's the first step is really cloud engineering. It requires a fundamentally different mindset. Um, and, and what is that? You know, well, some examples are, you know, infrastructure is a tax, right? This is, this is perhaps the way we would think about it in the past. You know, it's like, oh, I wrote all my app code and now I have to think about the infrastructure, oh, you know. Uh, so that's like, you know, developer thinking about it as a tax, but the business, you know, can think of it as a tax too. It's, it's like, uh, oh, you know, infrastructure is expensive. I have to, you know, spend all this money and it's, it's like a capital expenditure because I have to go buy servers or something like that. And that's, that's really not the way most folks that we see practicing cloud engineering think about it. In fact, the leaders in cloud engineering, you know, I mentioned Snowflake, I mentioned Atlassian, you know, a lot of the folks that we see doing this in the real world, they think of the cloud as a competitive advantage. This is really, you know, the move from capital expenditure to operating expenditure and, and really R&D expense. And, and the, often that's tied to something about the, the business that's employing, you know, us uh, cares about the cloud. Um, you know, you think of Airbnb, Lyft, Spotify, Snowflake, Uber, Amazon Web Services, um, all these folks without the cloud, their software just wouldn't be possible, it, or certainly it would be less impactful and it, a lot more expensive to operate and build. Um, and so how does that trickle down in, in such a team? Well, you know, the cloud goes from being an afterthought you know, where I can write all my code. And then, you know, I kind of mentioned earlier, you know, the quarterly planning meeting, you go, you know, you, you beg and plead for another server. Well, it goes from being an afterthought to really a superpower that we can harness to build more powerful software. And that's a mindset change. That's, you know, that, and that, that has to occur at multiple levels. It has to be the leaders in a team, it has to be developers who are excited to lean into this, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something new, right? And it also requires infrastructure teams to, to embrace this new reality where maybe they have to learn new skills with software engineering. Um, developers need to learn more about the cloud and infrastructure teams learn more about the software engineering practices. And we all meet in the middle, but it requires that everybody's committed to doing that. And so one, um, one way of thinking about this is really infrastructure is a building block. Um, you think of like, you know, objects, if you're doing object oriented programming, uh, you know, an object in your language is just, you know, it's a building block, right? You, you can assemble these things, you can stitch them together, you, you take a, you know, a container over here and a class of, a, you know, a list of customers over here or something, you, you assemble those together, you build something bigger out of it. And because infrastructure is software, we can do the same with uh, infrastructure as well, um, which, which is to say, you know, compute and networking are building blocks that power applications. Um, data stores are building blocks, just like a collection. You know, think of one way of thinking about a, a cloud queue, like an SQS queue in Amazon or, you know, um, something like that, or, you know, think of using Kafka. Well, how does that materialize in your application? Well, it's kind of just like a, a collection in your application. It's just that it has a life cycle provisioned outside of your app code. And that life cycle is persistent, 
and long lived. Um, but part of blurring the lines between applications and infrastructure is bringing some of those life cycle concepts closer to the application. So that as you spin up a new environment for your application, you're also spinning up that those, those long lived resources that you need. The same is true of AI and ML services, right? If I, you know, if I wanted to implement a deep neural network, you know, uh, in my application, well, I can go do that. And it's pretty complicated. I have to spend, I probably have to spend like multiple years personally reading, you know, research papers before I was ready to do that. Or, you know, I can use something like, you know, AWS recognition or, you know, Azure uh, vision or Google clouds, you know, various ML services. And I, I could just use those as though they were part of my application without having to go become an expert in ML. But again, that requires that I interface with the infrastructure. And finally, you know, scalability and global availability, I, you know, that can't be an afterthought that has to be built into the way I write my code. And so these are all examples of how infrastructure when viewed through this lens actually becomes a lot more exciting uh, and powerful rather than being, you know, something I wish I didn't have to worry about. Now, it's complicated. <laughs> I would say one of, one of the challenges with the modern cloud is, you know, this move, I mentioned the move from monolithic to distributed and static to dynamic, but that influences all aspects of my application. Um, if from all the way from, you know, what is the execution environment? Is that gonna be a serverless thing? Like if I'm using a gateway and every single API is an independent function that I have to manage. Um, and, and then of course, once I have to do that, I have to think about security of those functions. Um, and then, you know, or, or maybe I'm using containers, which maybe makes it a little bit easier because, you know, at least containers are, are stateful. Um, but in any case, there's a lot of things to manage. So when I say building blocks, these building blocks are actually quite fine grained. Um, you know, as example, as an example, here's, I mean, this is a snapshot probably from a few years ago for AWS. I think AWS has now over 300 services that you can use uh, and resources that you can stitch together uh, to build an application. Azure, Microsoft Azure is, is no different. Um, in fact, this is, you know, rapidly growing as well. Uh, and then Google Cloud, of course. So no matter where you go, um, you're gonna find complexity. And of course, uh, <laughs> there's a new cloud native project born every day. And so staying on top of that is, is borderline impossible as well. So, so how do we deal with this crazy amount of complexity? And, and by the way, the complexity is a good thing. Um, I, I don't want it to come across as though I'm I'm dissing the state of affairs in, in the cloud. I think it's, it's actually a really good thing because every one of those services, every one of these projects is, is a big bucket of innovation of a bunch of people that came together and solved a hard problem and made it available to you either as a service or as an open source project or a technology. The, the, the challenge is knowing what to use, when to use it and how to use it. And for me, I always, again, I, I, I hope it doesn't come across as academic, academic but you know, I always look to the past. Like, how do we solve this problem in the past? Surely we have faced the problem of being crushed um, underneath the weight of infinite complexity sometime in the past. And it turns out, yes. I mean, you just look at the entire history of software. Um, that's why we invented programming languages. You know, assembly language just didn't cut it anymore. We would have never built, you know, the, the sort of, applications we built even 20, 30 years ago if we didn't invent higher level programming languages. These days, back then higher level meant, you know, C, C++ these days, it means, you know, Node.js, JavaScript, um, Ruby, Python, Go. So, so one, one way to solve this is we need to enable ourselves to build bigger things out of smaller things. Um, take those infrastructure building blocks and assemble them into patterns that we can share and reuse rather than continually copy and pasting that same 30,000 lines of YAML that we have no idea what it did, but you know, Jeff, who used to be our you know, uh, DevOps guru has since left the company and left behind 30,000 lines of YAML and now I've inherited it and it's terrifying and I never wanna to touch it because I don't know what it does. Um, that's, not, that's not building bigger things out of smaller things. That's just drowning in complexity. 
And so to solve this problem, we really need to move beyond that to a world where we are sharing and reusing best practices in a more fundamental way. And that's where cloud engineering, applying software um, engineering can really help to, to solve this. Infrastructure as code is a key element. Again, I have a horse in the infrastructure as code race, but you know, take even setting that aside, it really is a critical way to manage infrastructure using software. And this has a long, rich history. You know, Chef and Puppet really transformed the way we thought about infrastructure because of the key insight that infrastructure is software and, it, and therefore is programmable and can be managed through software. And Chef and Puppet really were born in the world of, of virtual machines. And with virtual machines, you care more about configuring the virtual machine, right? You, you, you ask vSphere or you know, someone, hey, you spin up this virtual machine and then it spins up and it's done. And then and you say, okay, now I need to go install some software on the virtual machine. Um, I need to install an Nginx web server or whatever, um, you know, and, and, then, and then you've configured it, but, but then as the configuration changes, you know, you, you have a security patch. Now you need to go and actually patch that thing. But this is the model of, you know, uh, pets versus cattle, which I'm sure everybody here has kind of heard that, you know, a pet is something, if you lose it, it's terrible and, and you, you, you know, it's irreplaceable cattle. There's lots of them. And, you know, if you lose one, well, there's always more to, to be had. And I apologize for the vegans in the crowd. Uh, that's not my analogy, um, but it's pretty wide in wide use. But the move from, from the cattle versus, you know, from, from uh, sorry, from pets to cattle is really the move from configuration to provisioning. And so you look at newer infrastructure as code tools like Terraform and Pulumi, they operate on this notion of provisioning. And by the way, K Kubernetes fundamentally works in a very similar model where you, know, you declare a goal state, this infrastructure as code notion, uh, you know, Kubernetes drives towards that goal state and provisions whatever it needs to get there. CloudFormation, which AWS has had for quite a while, Azure Resource Manager templates, Google Cloud's Deployment Manager, and Terraform and Plumia are the multi-cloud kind of uh, uh, versions there. Um, they all kind of share this, this similar heritage. But again, once you start applying software engineering, you can build bigger things. I'll say one of my gripes personally with infrastructure as code historically has been, there's actually a lot of infrastructure as text out there. Um, you know, YAML, uh, YAML's fine. It's a light, the L stands for language, right? So I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to come here and, and be, you know, saying like, hey, YAML is not a real language. Of course it is, um, but it, it has limitations. YAML, YAML is meant for, it was designed to do one thing and to do it well, which is to describe a bit of data in a pretty seamless, concise way, but it's not meant to encode architecture. And, and everything I've talked about is leading up to this point is really that infrastructure is becoming part of the architecture of our applications. And as a result, this textual format that's not composable, it's not reusable, it's got all these flaws, has really broken down. And so this idea that infrastructure is software really allows us to take a lot of what we know and love about general purpose languages and apply it to infrastructure. We can architect using patterns and best practices. We have real sharing and reuse. We can be productive. You know, just think of the experience of editing YAML in your IDE. <laughs> You're, you're kind of, you know, at a loss, you're copy and pasting from over here, you get a web browser up over there, you know, you're not getting statement completion, you're not getting red squiggles when you mistype something, you can't right click and refactor or right click and go, go to definition. But when you start using real, um, uh, well, general purpose familiar languages, now you get all of those things, you become much more productive, you find things in milliseconds or seconds, whereas, you know, with the legacy approaches, you often find it you know, hours into, you know, after you've made the, the typo and often when it's too late, you've already tried to do deployment into production and now things are rolling back and you're scrambling, right? Order of magnitude difference. We can also test, you know, by, by using software engineering practices, we can test things and then secure. And, and I'll talk about that in, in just a minute because that's a really key component as well. So again, another one of these questions I'd ask if we're here in person, you know, I'd ask, hey, you know, how, how many folks out there test your application code? And I, I think most people would raise their hand. Um, maybe, you know, even if you don't, you'd raise it, you know, maybe even out of embarrassment, right? Because like everybody just knows like, hey, you test your code. Um, but we don't test our infrastructure. 
we we sort of just kind of throw it out there and then and then uh, things break or things don't break and the validation is is very rudimentary uh, in comparison to all of the rich testing and engineering discipline we have around applications and so um, one of the key elements of uh, cloud engineering is applying testing more holistically to the entire system, not thinking about applications here and infrastructure there, but instead thinking, I have a distributed system, how do I test that distributed system? When somebody tells me they want to test their infrastructure, it's, it's, it's kind of funny because you really can't know what they mean. There's, there's a lot of different ways you might be wanting to test your infrastructure. Uh, there's unit tests for basic code correctness. There's integrations uh, tests. You know, for example, unit tests. Maybe I have a library and I just want to test the library. Or maybe uh, it's it's a it's a infrastructure blueprint for how to do you know a, a VPC and I want to unit test it to make sure the CIDR blocks are distributed correctly. Um, or I want to unit test my microservice to make sure the HTTP, HTTP APIs reply correctly. Or I might want to do integration testing for the whole system. Uh, and by whole system, I, I mean, you know, at least how does my microservice interact with that other microservice, but maybe the entire system as a whole. So it's sort of a, it, it's a spectrum. It's not, it's not a, a binary thing. Um, we often see a lot of folks doing cloud engineering wanting to do pre-deployment testing for the entire whole system. And for that, you know, ephemeral environments where I might actually spin up an entire copy of my infrastructure in a GitHub pull request. And before marking that thing green, I might run a battery of tests. And then after it's complete marked, you know, the pull request is ready to merge. Or if it fails, mark it as not ready to merge. And then, you know, you find things much sooner that way. And of course, there's post-deployment testing, like long-lived testing. Hey, I just did a deployment to production. Want to run a bunch of tests to make sure, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's still, it's functional after I've done my deployment. But then it's, potentially too late, although there's canaries in, in blue-green deployments and more sophisticated patterns where you can integrate that sort of um, gradual testing into the way you're doing deployments. And then there's even more advanced things like fuzz testing, you know, what happens if this whole availability zone goes out or this whole region goes out, does the failover happen correctly? A um, lot, lot of different things you can do here, but really it's the idea of taking automation, taking software and, um, and making the most out of it. So security is not an afterthought for cloud engineering. One of the things we see with cloud engineering teams is by applying software engineering practices, we can actually bring a lot of those same things we learned. I mean, one of the things I worked on uh, early in my career was a lot of the, you know, just remember back in the day when Windows had, you know, zero days left and right and, you know, static analysis, we, 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 we applied static analysis and better programming languages to find a lot of those problems. What we did is we actually brought security into the inner loop of how developers were writing and verifying their code. And now we're finding all new attack vectors and problems in, in the cloud that is informing how we incorporate security into the inner loop. So you look at a technology like Sneak, which is amazing, uh, where it's finding problems right then and there as you're, as you're developing your code, as you're in a pull request. Um, and it really allows you to enforce best practices early and often, but you know, even once it's in prod, um, you know, you're not done, right? Uh, I think, you know, detecting and remediate pro remediating problems that always and often, I think is, is the name of the game here. And teams that move to the cloud engineering model can do all of these things that I just talked about, the testing, the security, you know, everything, collaborating on GitHub, uh, they can do it across applications and infrastructure. These things can version alongside each other's. Um, the infrastructure that becomes part of the application can ship with the application code. The infrastructure that's more of the platform can ship independently, but still be delivered, you know, into many, many regions using similar practices, practices and tools, uh, similar validation approaches to validation. And, and by the way, you know, I didn't talk about multi-cloud here. It's a lightning rod, but a lot of teams we see doing cloud engineering, the practices that they're adopting, the workflows they're adopting actually transcend any one cloud provider. So they can take that way of working together and really just either go to multiple clouds at the same time or you know, make that shift when, when, when they need to. But that's a whole topic for another day. And then the last kind of bit here is really thinking about once the code gets into production, what are the engineering practices we're going to apply to make sure we find issues and that we, we react to those issues? Um, 
So, you know, in the Air Force, they have this notion of an OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, act. The idea is if you can't observe what's going wrong, you can't do anything about it. Uh, and if you don't make a decision, you can't act on it. But at the end of the day, you ultimately need to act on, on the things you're observing. And, and really that's where thinking about observability and debugability from day one, again, is a distributed system we're building, right? And so if you're trying to debug a distributed system, you take very different approaches to logging, performance metrics, tracing, all of these things. There are tons of great projects out there and products like Honeycomb is clearly best in class here and a lot, a lot of technologies that, um, that are worth exploring for sure. And then add all that up and you ship you know, faster with confidence, go from shipping quarterly to shipping always. And that's, that's kind of, that's the nirvana we're all trying to reach. Um, so with that, I, I think I covered, you know, everything I wanted to here. So I'll, I'll bring it home and just summarize, you know, I think cloud engineering really is a new, exciting way of building, really applying software engineering to tame the complexity that we see in the modern cloud. It's as much about culture as it is technology, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. Cultural changes are hard, but once you're committed, you can make them. Um, and, you know, the switching cost is, it can be overnight if you're really committed to it. Um, it really enables teams to be empowered to collaborate in new ways. And again, move faster with confidence, which is what we all want. And TLDR, you can go from looking like this, where we've got this hard wall between us. You know, it's hard to have conversations. Developers just focus on code. Infrastructure teams just focus on infra. To something more like this, we're happier, we're working together, we're building better software together. And who doesn't want that? So that's it for me. Um, Thank you for having me here today. And I think we can open it up for questions. I think we've got almost 15 minutes to go. So I will switch to Slack. And Tom, please tell me if I'm doing something incorrect because I'm uh, switching between Slack and here. So I don't know if I, I'm, I'm seeing anything. No, you're fine. You're fine, uh, Joe. It looks like uh, we have somebody typing something in right now. I'm sure it'll pop up in a second. There you go. Excellent. Yeah, so Peter asked, what's the first step in breaking down the wall between developers and operations? You know, it, it depends on where you're coming from, I would say. Um, what we see is, is kind of three patterns typically, um, you know, one is if you're coming from, you're in an enterprise and you're looking to, to get there. I mean, clearly you need sort of relatively high level buy-in from your architecture team or, or whoever. Um, but usually the initiative starts from the infrastructure team. Uh, in those cases, the infrastructure team wants to modernize and they, to do that, they need to empower the organization around them. And often that means adopting Kubernetes. Well, <laughs> Kubernetes can be overkill. So that's, that's like a huge lift to start with, but you know, even starting a CI CD can be a real pivotal change for the organization because once you do that, now you've got, um, you know, developers shipping more often and you'll start to see the friction emerge where a developer needs a new environment or you need to scale to a new region or, you know, you're moving to a serverless architecture. And, and so if there's a public cloud effort, you know, I think the public cloud really forces some of this uh, as well. But I would say public cloud, CI, CD, and Kubernetes are three sort of tools that help to, to just take that first step. It's a, it's a long journey. We've worked with some customers where it takes, you know, multiple years to get there. I'll say if you're in a startup, you can afford, you know, or even just a, a relatively small company, you know, 100 folks or, or fewer, you can usually, you know, really make more of a top down decision and, and more fundamentally upend how you're doing things and, and often coincident with maybe a new service you're delivering, right? Hey, we need to build a new identity service or we need to build a new, um, actually one team we're working with at Cisco building, you know, the the, the blurring functionality for, for WebEx, right? So to blur your video. So that's like one service you can carve out and go build in a new way. So hopefully that helps. 
Um, Vince asks, what factors do you use to determine between container and serverless implementations? Yeah, this one, you know, you'll get different answers from different people. For me, the key defining characteristic is, and by the way, it's, it's, it's confusing because especially AWS, they use the serverless brand for a lot of different services, right? Like, so Fargate, which is actually based on containers, is server, a sort of a serverless implementation of containers. And by serverless, they just mean, hey, you don't have fixed capacity. They'll dynamically scale based on workload. When answering this question, to me, containers and serverless, serverless is about the functions. So serverless functions like Lambda or Azure functions. And if you define it that way, I think really the function model is if you can represent your workload in your application in an event-driven style where it's natural to break something into functions, if functions are the granularity of scaling, then serverless is a good fit. That is actually not very frequently the case. Um, you know, an event-driven system, yes. Uh, a stateful application that, you know, fundamentally like a database, you're not going to implement a database using serverless functions because it would just be, you know, you have to store the data somewhere between each function invocation. And so to me, it's usually, hey, either it's event oriented or it's not. And if it's event oriented, serverless is a great fit. If it's not, then containers is, would be my default. There's always exceptions to that rule of thumb, but that's typically what I, what I think. Um, I did think, I think I saw some chats too. So Mark asked, how do you encourage devs and solution architects to get into a DevOps mentality to stretch their knowledge and walls? That's a, that's a great question. Um, it's usually when people have felt the pain, um, you know, like nobody likes filing a ticket and waiting for a month to get what they need. <laughs> Um, and, and so what we found is if you can give developers and solutions architects the tools and technologies to be more self-serve, to really be more in control of their own destiny, what we've seen is that they, they want to stretch, they want to learn. There's certainly some folks who, who, who resist the change, who, you know, this is the way we've always done it, this is the way we, we have to continue doing it. But typically, you know, in these more modern efforts where, you know, hey, we, we need to live and breathe every day doing CI CD in Kubernetes on AWS, like you kind of can't avoid it in, in those circumstances. Um, and so that that's what we've seen is, but, but really the thing, the anti-pattern is asking developers to learn this new domain specific language or this technology that's, all, that's completely foreign to them, right? Like learn, asking them to learn Chef or Puppet as much as I love Chef or Puppet it's just so complicated for a developer to come up to speed. It's like asking, you know, a developer, hey, I know you like Node.js or, hey, I know you like Java. Can you go learn, you know, this, to do Fortran or something like, you know, developers just say, what, are you crazy? No, I don't want to. Um, so, so really picking the right tools, I think is, is key to enabling that as well. Uh, Fred, Observe that you know getting management to stop viewing infrastructure as a tax, tax or business expense, and as a competitive advantage. Agree one hundred percent. That that is um, almost every company we see who succeeds at this um, transformation has that mindset at all levels of the company. By the way, even and oftentimes the way this transformation often happens is, you know somebody more with an engineering background will now assume responsibility for both infrastructure and development because the CEO or the CIO or whoever wants to accelerate this change. And then that person will put in place leadership that really gets sort of software engineering practices and that sort of ripples throughout the entire organization. Again, the bigger the company, the less the cloud is disrupting their business, the harder this change tends to be. It's just not as existentially urgent to, to some businesses. Great questions, by the way. Keep them, keep them coming. If anybody has any questions whatsoever about sort of developers, infrastructure, management stuff, anything's fair game. <laughs> 
Yeah, so Mark asks, what's the first step to moving to CICD? Um, I think the first step is picking the, the software you're gonna deliver. I, I, I think CI is easier to start with because really about producing builds and verifying the builds and then putting the builds somewhere, right? So many organizations have sort of figured out CI in my experience, but have yet to figure out CD. I think it's really picking what is the sort of the blast radius? What is the first piece of software that you're gonna take and you're gonna actually deliver continuously? And and that, that's uh, frank, frankly, it's, you know, virtual machines, containers, serverless, they all come with their own unique challenges, but I think, you know, pick any of those and you can't go wrong because you're gonna, you're gonna be forced to confront a lot of challenges like the security model. I think security is tough when it comes to CICD. In fact, for, for folks who are leaning really heavily into cloud engineering, the CICD pipeline is like one of the most privileged environments that exist because it, it, it can go to prod and actually roll out changes. And so it's really important to get key management and roles and, and authentication correct for that and really lock down access. And so picking one thing, to make, you know, make sure it's small, make sure the blast radius is not huge is the first thing. I would say storage is tough. So starting with something that's compute, like it's a web app or something like, automatically provisioning databases and Kubernetes clusters and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of folks do that, but that's that's certainly like sort of next levels. <laughs> I would start with a something that's more compute oriented, like a, a simple web app. Um, and Jason asks, any good patterns for ephemeral environments without having an EKS cluster? Um, easy configuration of the environment to point to different dependent services. Yeah, I think um, I think we see a, a spectrum of folks who really think about their environments as monolithic and all the way to distributed, like lots of different pieces. And so for some folks, they'll have like a shared Kubernetes cluster that's used for testing. And they, they use namespaces to partition and it's, you know, a giant Kubernetes cluster and like all the test stuff runs within it. And then what you can do is for each application or service, you can actually deploy into that as part of your testing, clean it up, and, and not have to go through provisioning the, the cluster completely. Um, that said, if you want to test ephemeral environments, even without the Kubernetes uh, piece, um, you know, we've seen folks using Docker Compose, and you, you can kind of mock services. I'll caution, though, like, everybody wants to mock the services. And in some cases, you do. Like that example I gave earlier, like, can you even run Airbnb's entire distributed application on a single desktop? Probably not. I don't know the answer, but I would guess the answer is no. So you inherently have to mock some things. And so you might mock your compute environment if you don't want to take the Kubernetes dependency. But anytime you're doing mocking, you have to know you're making a trade-off because you're doing something that is not reflective of the actual environment you're going to deploy into. So you're making a trade-off. You're doing it because it's speed and cost, right? It's, it's much cheaper to do it that way, but you're going to spend a lot of time trying to perfect that mock when in fact it's impossible to make perfect. Uh, and then you're gonna, some things are gonna slip through the cracks. You're gonna say, hey, my ephemeral environment test passed. Why did this thing fail when it got to production? You're gonna say, oh, the mock was imperfect in these ways. But that said, it's all a series of trade-offs. And so we certainly see a lot of folks doing this. Um, so Vince asks, you know, any tips for keeping your development cloud platform agnostic? Yeah. I. I think the first thing is to know that cloud agnostic workflow is much easier than cloud agnostic application development. And what I mean by that is you can have a CI CD solution. You can have, um, you know, a solution for infrastructure as code and policy, how you, how you apply policy to these things that is not specific to a, a cloud platform. For example, Pulumi, that's like, that's exactly what we do. We give you a cloud agnostic, platform for all this stuff where you can deploy to AWS, Azure, GCP, and know that, you know, you've got one standard way of working as a team, you know, GitLab, Armory with Spinnaker, you know, there's a lot of solutions out there that, that chip away at different parts of this uh, problem. Um, that said, if you want your application code to be cloud platform agnostic, that's tough. Uh, Kubernetes is basically a cloud platform agnostic container architecture where it's got its own nouns and verbs. And if you learn those, it's a platform that can go anywhere. So you can write, you can run on-prem, you can run that same workload in the cloud. 
The danger though, is once you're in AWS, if you're not really leveraging everything that makes AWS special, you're at a disadvantage. You've got this buffer between you and the latest innovation that AWS is shipping. And so again, to my trade-offs point earlier, sometimes it's the right thing to do, but what we've seen work best in practice is it's similar to building like a game engine, right? You think of like Unity engine, you know, that can run a game on iOS or Android or Windows. You know, like 80% of the code is shared, but there's always that 20% that you're gonna specialize for that target platform because you want the best performance, you want the best access to features. You gotta integrate, in the case of the game engine, we need to integrate with like the windowing system. It's similar with cloud, right? Like 80% typically can be cloud agnostic if, if you, if you approach it the right way, like the application code. I mean, yeah, you're using a database, but you know, maybe it's a MySQL database and that's going to be the same protocol no matter where you go. But there's always that amount you have to specialize. And I would say don't resist the specialization because I, I think that just slows you down. And like going to multi-cloud and trying to paper over what makes each of the clouds special prematurely, we see a lot of folks failing hard when they start down that path. So I say only go there if you have a good business reason. Many people do. Either you, like you've acquired a company and that company brings with them a different cloud dependency, you're a SaaS vendor and you need to deploy to your customers, AWS, Azure, GCP, on-prem. There are a lot of good reasons you do need to go multi-cloud, but I wouldn't go there prematurely. So I know, I know we're at time or I think we're at time um, and I can stick around for a few more minutes if, if folks still have questions, but I want to be respectful. And I just want to thank everybody for being here today. I, I had a ton of fun and I hope you did too. I wish I could be in Philly in person, but you know, maybe next year. Okay, Joe, we'll probably wrap up the session, but uh, the room is still open for questions. If anybody wants to post anything, if you want to respond. Joe, thank you so much for doing this. It was really interesting. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Take care.